and with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Humphreys, who's going to talk about a relatively relevant topic after this morning's M&M. <laughs> so, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, I was a resident here, and I'm now a faculty here, and over the course of the last couple of years as I've been a faculty, I've heard a few different talks, and I've heard discussion in this forum about competence and confidence. And then as one of the associate program directors for general surgery, I sort of assess the competence of the residents. And some of you have recently had your fall review and some of you will be coming in to, to meet with me because Dr. Galante is out. But we try to talk about some of the competence things and I always try to bring in some sort of assessment of how the resident is doing also in terms of their life in terms of their confidence and what's going on with them. So we're gonna talk a little bit about both of these concepts today. So I have no financial disclosures, but I will tell you that I just had my first cup of coffee right now, so it's just hitting me. And people know that when I drink coffee, I get a little excited. Um, and of course, I, I do drink a lot of Kool-Aid. I used this, this disclosure last year too, and it's still relevant this year. So if you don't like any of the Kool-Aid that I'm serving today, it's okay, all right? The objectives, you have to have objectives. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the link between competence and confidence. And I'm also gonna discuss some of the changes that have come in how we're assessing the competency of residents today. I'm gonna present some data on confidence and I'm gonna focus on what's called imposter syndrome, which some of you may be quite familiar with. And then we're gonna talk about methods to improve confidence in residents from both an internal, meaning a trainee perspective, and then also from an educator perspective. And I'm going to mention some of the resources, but really that's something that I prefer to talk about in a one-on-one -on -one situation. So if you ever want to know some of, the, um, some of the resources that are more personal, we can chat a little bit about that. But um, So when you look at competence, the definition is the ability to perform a specific or, acti or, or activity or job properly. And then when you define confidence, it's sort of that self-assuredness in one's personal judgment or ability. And the thing to remember is that projected ability is the ability or it, projected confidence is the ability to instill confidence to others in your competence. So they are quite linked. And it's very natural for people to interpret a confident manner as evidence of competence. And that is something that I think is, is we don't always realize. So, and it also follows that a lack of projected confidence is perceived as a lack of competence. So one of my favorite commercials is this commercial with this guy here. Has anybody ever seen it? So this gentleman is a DJ and it's a certified financial planner um, video and he comes in he's dressed like this however they clean him up they make him look like a, a regular person and he comes in and they ask me <laughs> sorry I'm not going to say it like that but they make him look like a professional and he comes in and he starts talking to people about their financial planning and he's like you probably should get a 401k or you need to diversify and at the end of the conversation they say to him or they ask the people that have come in, how confident do you feel in this person's ability to be your financial planner? And many of the people were like, I'm very confident. I'd love for you to be my financial planner. Well, then he gets up and he starts doing like the running man and he's like, well, actually I'm a DJ. So, yeah, uh, and I think that's super funny because this is his normal day life. And I think that it's a funny commercial to me, but it also really exemplifies what it is meant that appearance and the way you stand and the way that you carry yourself really can exert confidence and portray competence. So when we think about resident education and how we assess competency, there are the six core competencies. And if you don't know these core companies, you've clearly been under a rock for a while, but these are the core companies, competencies that the ACGME put forward for physicians. And these were developed through what was called the Outcomes Project. It started in 1999. And the project, the goal of the project was to define competencies that residencies could use to say that a resident is skilled enough to go out and practice independently. And so they implemented the core competencies in 2002. And residencies were expected to put these core competencies within their own curriculum 
and to see and improve in the outcome and the, it's called the outcomes project and the outcome was um, the insurance that programs were going to educate physicians who could practice independently and this pro this project ran from 2002 to 2008 and we still we still use the competencies but what they discovered was that these competencies although they were put out there and they were ingrained in the curriculum they still were unable to really um, get to the outcome so even though we had evaluations that talked about the six core competencies and we evaluated residents in their knowledge or patient care or professionalism these were not really enough to predict who was going to be able to practice independently and many, I mean, many of you know that whenever your, uh, the residents know that when the, um, the goals for the rotation come, they're all kind of based around these core competencies. Um, so in 2008, at the end of this project, when they were looking at the data, they found that there still was no clear connection between achieving good evaluations in the core competencies and being able to practice independently with confidence. So thus was developed the Milestone Project. And the Milestone Project, some of you may love it, um, a lot of the faculty may not love it um, because it is more time consuming from a faculty evaluation perspective, but it's actually something that started in 2013 with the goal of addressing what were the shortcomings of the core competencies. And the goal was to make very explicit definitions of what got you from a novice up to a graduating uh, resident or a or being proficient at a task and then what would be considered expert and with each milestone or each level there is specific definitions of what the expectations of the residents are what the knowledge the skills and what the attributes and performance should be so this is the table that we, we think of when we think of the milestone project. It starts at novice, which is down at the bottom on the y-axis, and it goes up to expert, um, and then it goes across in terms of level. So we would like to see our residents at the PGY1 level start at novice, and then move up to where a graduating resident would be considered proficient. And then the, the hope is that they become an expert over time as they go into their career. Um, the benefits of the milestone project for residents um, was that a lot of times when you get your evaluation you see on there in certain areas the resident did a good job and that is not the constructive feedback that the residents felt they needed from evaluations to actually make changes. So the early experience with the milestone assessment um, has been that residents appreciate a more detailed and specific evaluation that comes with the milestones. And they're also able to provide a set of expectations for the residents of where they should be and how they should move along. So the residents, when they come in to do their fall reviews, are given the milestone um, uh, sheet. And I'll show you an example of what it looks like. And they're sort of asked to fill out where they think they are on the scale at the time. But more than just using that to assess where you are, you should also be using that to assess where you are going and what the next steps should be for you to achieve the next level of, um, or the next milestone moving yourself towards being a novice in certain areas and proficient. And it's broken down by the core competencies. But the goal of the project or the milestones assessment is that for the residents, it would give explicit expectations for the residents. And later in the year, we're going to have a talk about expectations and um, perceptions from one of the chief residents. So I think that'll be interesting to, to talk a little bit about that. But it also gives information about where you need to work on. It gives defined feedback from faculty members to the residents. And then there's early identification. The milestones can be used as early identification for underperformers. People that may be at the PGY3 level, but yet are performing a little bit lower than where you would expect them to be. For the program, it gives a very guided curriculum for development. And it also allows us to, again, identify underperformers. And then for the public to use this particular um, uh, tool, 
it really gives people that are coming to a teaching hospital an understanding of maybe where, and not everybody is going to be savvy enough to look at this, I realize, but some patients want to know a little bit about what a first-year resident may do compared to a chief or get some kind of information for that. So for stakeholders that may be interested in medical education, it gives definitions for what a physician should be able to do at the completion of training, and it can also be used for program accreditation. So when we look at the template for the milestone project, this is what the base template looks like. It goes from level one to level five. There are nine boxes at the bottom of the template here so that you get a score from one to nine. And then whenever we are assessing where a resident is or when the milestones are developed for each individual residency, each individual fellowship, it adheres to these kinds of levels. So level one is what do we expect a beginner to be able to do? Level two moves into what are the milestones for a resident who has advanced over entry but is still performing slightly lower than a mid-level resident? And then it goes up into what are the key development milestones for a mid-level resident? And then what should they be able to do well in the realm of the specialty at this point? Within, and these are specialty specific. So general surgery has a set, vascular surgery has a set, um, cardiothoracic has a set of milestones for their own residencies, pediatrics, all of these. Um, and then when you get to level four, it's what does a graduating resident look like? Um, what additional knowledge, skills, and attitudes have they obtained? And you think about it as, are they ready for certification? So I'm going to give a couple of examples of how we use the milestones. And I, I think that all of us can, um, will get a, a little bit, I think it's kind of funny, you may not think it's as funny as me, but we're gonna talk about the core competency of professionalism. And I want all of the residents to think about this as I put up the scale where you are on the professionalism scale, okay? So deficient over here, and this only goes up to four. But we're gonna use the example of your operative logs and your case, and your, your operative case logs and your duty hours. So level one is that the resident completes his or her operative cases and duty hours and other assigned tasks in a timely fashion. <laughs> and that's why I chose this, this particular example. So sometimes I don't even think I'm a level one. Like, am I doing my case logs all the, you know? Um, and so level four, we'll go, we'll just skip over the middle. So Jacob, you're level four, you're gonna graduate. Not only are you doing your case logs and duty hours in a timely fashion, you're making sure that everybody else on your team is doing it. You're leading by example. You are making sure everybody knows how great you are at filling out your, your case logs and doing your duty hours. That's the level four. I'm gonna check that box for you, okay? <laughs> um, so I know that we do have a little bit of trouble with getting the residents to do some of their, their duty hours and things like that, but um, this is part of the, the core competency for professionalism. And this in the milestone project is how it is defined. So when you are going through your milestones at, at a resident level, you can look at this. Are you at a level one? And you should be honest. Because when you turn in your milestones, we're not necessarily trying to ding you or penalize you for where you are in the, the competency. We're trying to help you see where you, you are and how you can grow. So, but it, it is, uh, so when we look at this one core competency of professionalism, there are other core competencies that you can look at from the milestone project. Just before you move on from that, just want to let the residents know that it doesn't end when you finish your residency. As a faculty member, uh, if you don't uh, sign off on your central line documentation, if you don't do your uh, sign your charts within 48 hours, not only does a note every single day come to me, sign <laughs> all of the faculty. Really? But <laughs> maybe I am deficient. <laughs> every single faculty, every single day, they know who you are, and um, at a certain level, in order if the feeling that professionalism is not adequately achieved through this kind of conversation, that there are fines. The people are fined now for not getting their paperwork done and signing their orders in a timely fashion. So this goes
go, this is something that you need to learn now because it will be with you for the rest of your life. And if you are in private practice, that's also your billing. So if you're not turning in your billing and getting your billing in, you're not getting money. So there are more than one ways to look at it. Yes, Dr. Hundle. Yes, I'm in surgery. Right, but one of the other aspects of professionalism, and I thought she was going to mention this, is that when somebody has been in the hospital for 36 hours and uh, taken care of patients uh, and uh, didn't get a certain administrative task in, uh, she gives them a pass on that. It's the persistent, it's a persistent. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, that uh, yes. uh, counts. And being a professional uh, sort of requires uh, embracing uh, mission, primacy of patient care, things like that. It's more than the simple process steps. And, you know, that's just part of maturing as a physician. Absolutely, and that is why there's the levels, because we see that as our residents move through the program, they do grow. So if we wanted to look at interpersonal uh, relationships, and again, this goes deficient over on this side, and then one, two, three, four. But these are some of the things that we expect that you should be able to do as you move through your um, training. You start with the, the level one intern, the willingness to exchange information with the patient and team members, um, responding politely and promptly woo, um, to requests from co for consults and coordinated care activities. And then you move into negotiating the management of conflicts amongst, or conflicts amongst care providers, et cetera. So there is this graduated way that you slowly assimilate these. So I would encourage all of the residents and even all of the faculty when you are doing these milestone evaluations for the residents or if we're using them in other ways that you, you use it as a guide of where maybe you are, honestly assess that and use it as a goal to help you move forward. Um, when we look at uh, how it's being used, usually it's being used in the core, uh, clinical competency committee. So we have in vascular surgery, what we have is our faculty, but we also have a nurse that comes and does the milestone evaluations with us for the residents. And the more eyes that you have on it, administrators, having some of the other residents on the committee to look at it, the more eyes that you have on it actually closely reflects where the trainee is. Um, and it allows for the same process to be applied uniformly. And it also allows for less individual bias that comes forward from the faculty. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a tool for self-assessment. So um, when you look at the data on the milestone project, this is the milestones did not just roll out or have not only been used in the United States, but when they looked at 122 pairs of residents from level one to their mid second year, what they found is in most cases, people do tend to go up in all of the categories. So they started this is year one of professionalism, year two. And so using the milestone project, they found most people go up. You do have some people that go down. And how to address that or what to do with that is something that we ha they don't really talk about here. But on average, as trainees are moving through the curriculum, you do see that they are attaining these skills. So we're gonna shift from the competence model that we're using now, and we're gonna move into confidence because confidence is something that I think is incredibly difficult. And we'll talk about some of the background of confidence, but this study was put forward um, a few years ago and it looked at <coughs> trainees' confidence in general surgery residents. So they surveyed 4,136 residents and they sort, this is a breakdown of the demographics, um, looking at the age, the mean age is 31. The, about 30% are female. And then you can see the breakdown by residency year. 50% are married. Um, and the others are either single and in a relationship or single. And then you can see the breakdown of how many children each of the residents had. When you look at the distribution of the programs, it's, um, there's a larger concentration in the Northeast, but it's sort of spread out um, throughout the South, Midwest, and West. And then they looked at university-based programs, community programs, and then they also sort of, or they also looked at um, the number of chief residents in a program and how that sort of affected confidence um, based on the NEAR survey. Um, the, the NEAR survey itself was a, 
um, confidence survey. It was the, I can't remember the acronym now. There are a lot of acronyms in the world today, but um, it's an early assessment of residency um, satisfaction, I think, but it was mainly geared to look at, um, to look at confidence. And when they looked at the breakdown of operating skills by level, do the residents think that their operating skills are appropriate for their level? And they also looked at the outcome of, do residents feel that they will be able to operate independently at the end of their training? And so this survey assessed those two factors within the residents. And what you can see is that women tended to believe, they disagreed with the idea that they were operating at an appropriate level and they also were less confident, so that is they agree that they have concerns regarding be able, being able to operate independently when the training ends. We also found that residency year affects how you feel about your goals, and that's reasonable. At the first year, you are very concerned that you are not going to, to be able to operate independently, or you're concerned about your operations at your, your specific level, but that decreases by the time you are a uh, over the fifth year, that's Ben Keller. He's like in year what, 10, 11. So, um, um, but also marital status. <laughs> so marital status also affects whether or not you feel comfortable and the number of children. The more children you have, the more you have less concern that you are able. I guess you feel, you know, if you can get this two-year-old to eat these beets, you're dang sure gonna be able to take out an appendix on your own. Um, <clears throat> but they also looked at uh, confidence based on some of the program attributes. So when you look at, at this particular um, thing, the, the thing that was significant is, you know, Midwest and West, there's small um, things about ge geography, but university-based programs and community-based programs, there was a difference in terms of concerns about being able to operate independently when training ends. In 29% of the residents at university programs were concerned about that, whereas in the community-based programs, only 20% were. And again, military residents had a, a slightly higher, but that wasn't statistically significant. And the other thing that became apparent is the number of chiefs. So the more chiefs you have within your program, that may be something that uh, provides you additional comparisons between people so that you may not feel that you are as good as somebody else or doing on par. And that too was uh, a factor for people being concerned about being able to operate independently later on. So when they put all of this into a multivariable model, what they found that the true risk factors for being less confident amongst general surgery residents are being female, being single, uh, and then the younger residents in terms of their postgraduate year. The program predictors, which I, I didn't really put that chart on there, but in places where people were more satisfied with their program, they were less likely to feel that they were deficient. In places where the residents were more dissatisfied with their program, they were more likely to feel less or to feel um, that they didn't have confidence. And then one of the factors that I found was interesting was um, fear of the faculty. <clears throat> so this was uh, the pro one of the program predictors. In places where the residents were concerned about how the faculty viewed them, the faculty viewed them as less individually as less competent, or the they were they feared that the faculty were going to um, criticize them for not being able to do a procedure. Those residents tended to have less confidence in their ability to operate independently later on. So we're going to take this and we're going to move into some of this idea of fear. And to do that, we're gonna talk about imposter syndrome, which I think is a very powerful factor in residency because it's typically found in, it's a, it was described in by Clance and Imes in 1978. Um, it was originally described in very high achieving women and they believed that the, the syndrome itself was due to this sort of societal sex role stereotype that women were seen most often to be in the house um, vacuuming, but yet there were these women who were pushing boundaries and doing these things, and they were um, there was this disconnect between their role in society, what was portrayed on television, 
and their role in the world. So the definition of it is this internal experience of intellectual phoniness. This idea that you are not meant to be here, that you are not good enough to be here, that you um, were here by luck, that you didn't actually, you don't have the skills to be doing what you are doing in this particular, um, in this particular arena. And over the years, as they've done more work with this, the risk factors are actually not, it's not only high achieving women. The true risk factors are very high achieving individuals. So anybody who is in a very stressful type um, field where they are in a high performance uh, uh, field or first generation um, professionals. So people that are, come from a family that hasn't gone to college and then not only does the, the person go to college but then they move into some kind of a professional realm um, and then individuals who are maybe pursuing a new career path. You were an engineer and now all of a sudden you want to be a playwright or whatever you decide you want to do and it's this whole other um, career path and although you may be doing well in it, you perceive that you are not doing as well as others. And so when you look at imposter syndrome and if you are interested in more about it, there is a, a wonderful TED talk by Amy Cuddy who talks a little bit about it and will use some of her methods for overcoming it or talk about those methods later on in the talk. Um, but when you look at imposter syndrome and burnout within American medical students, this is a pilot study where they surveyed 138 medical students. And there is a, there is a um, if you want to know if you maybe have imposter syndrome, there's a Clance imposter syndrome scale that you can use and it's uh, 20 questions and you go through and you rate it from one to five and then you add it up and then it tells you kind of where you fall into the scale. Um, if, uh, if you're interested, and that's a, a reference that I can give you online. But what they found is that if you had, these are the burnout components, depersonalization, um, emotional exhaustion, professional efficiency, and when they looked at the degree of burnout compared to people that had imposter syndrome or had a high score on the imposter syndrome scale, what they found is that patient, or trainees, medical students, who were more likely to have imposter syndrome tended to have um, more burnout in terms of depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, overall exhaustion, and cynicism. And I think cynicism is something that occasionally we portray whenever we are burnt out or exhausted. And when they looked at the, some of the same measures in residents, and they're looking at, again, imposter syndrome versus burnout, and they used the mean scores on this Clance imposter scale, and they found when they looked at some of the characteristics of these particular individuals, what they found was that women tended to have a, a higher score, and they also tended to be, um, or more women that were had a higher score or a burnout score also were more likely to be imposters. Um, when you look at foreign medical graduates, those two people that necessarily didn't see themselves as needing to be here, or, uh, not needing, but um, see themselves as um, good enough to be here, tended to be another particular issue. But it's important to realize that the confidence that comes from imposter syndrome then spills over to what we see in terms of our performance and burnout and can also be displayed in terms of competence. So one of the most important things is to recognize behaviors that residents will display whenever they lack confidence. And some of those are the inability, and, and this is not meant to pick out small one-time instances. This is meant to display patterns of behavior. So inability to frequently ask, answer questions the repetitive use of I don't know whenever they're asked questions by a specific faculty, for instance, um, or the inability to ever come across with an answer. Some of that is just a lack of confidence in their ability to answer the question. Um, Over-apologizing, um, use of self-deprecating behavior beyond what would be um, particularly <coughs> normal, inability to ask for help. And this, again, doesn't feed back to things this morning, but sometimes there is this lack of confidence that they will be perceived as stupid because they have to ask for help with something. Um, one of the things that's the most interesting is not wanting to take on new tasks. So at times we think, well, 
perhaps the, the, the trainee is just you know, lazy or they don't want to participate in certain things, but they may simply lack confidence in certain areas. And then the inability to clearly present their thoughts, which we can see sometimes whenever we're doing rounds and we have students come in to present their, um, to do a presentation on, on rounds and they're still nervous because they, they lack a little bit of confidence in that particular area. But all of these stem from some sort of fear. Fear of being um, found out, fear of um, being judged in certain ways, but the underlying um, feeling or the underlying emotion is typically fear. So how do we as educators and as um, colleagues sort of instill or improve confidence? And so we're going to talk about internal ways to improve confidence, which are the ability for you to control your own confidence. And we'll talk about power postures, perfectionism, and some goal-directed learning. And then we'll talk about ways for educators to improve confidence within our trainees, which are recognitions of learning styles, use of alternative educational styles, and then goal-directed training. Um, so when you look at communication and confidence, 7% of your communicating confidence is your words, 38% of it is the tone of your voice, but about 55% of it is your body language or your body movements. And so when you have certain power postures is what they're called, that instills more confidence in um, people and what they think of you. So these are various power poses or power postures. And when you look at the research on power posing, and we'll, we'll talk more about it, what they found, this is a study that was done by a couple of people from Harvard, Amy Cuddy and um, I can't remember the first person, the, the other person's first name, but it's Karna, are both at the Harvard Business School. And what they did was they took people and they put them in these specific power poses. So you either were in what was considered a low power pose, so you're sitting like this or you're you know, closed off, or you were in a um, a high power pose, hands on your hips, you know, arms back, really aggressively leaning over the table. And you were told to do this, you were in the power pose for two minutes. And then after that, they did a few different studies. So there are multiple studies that, that they did with this. And they found that people that adopted the high power poses were more likely to be perceived from um, employers that were looking, they went into these job interview type um, situations. But you were more likely to hire one of the people that was, had done one of these versus one of the low power poses. And so there's this concept of fake it till you make it, and this is one way to do it. This is one way to necessarily give yourself a moment of confidence. So before we, I got up to give this talk, um, I got up and got a cup of coffee and I stood over here on the side and I just stood there and I put my hands in my pockets and I'm very cool and calm and collected so that when I get up here, I can feel more like this person rather than feeling like everybody in the room is judging me and I'm an idiot and God, can we just go do our cases and will she stop talking? So those are the things that you can use as small techniques. Letting go of perfectionism. This is a book that a patient gave me I was, I don't know, I don't know what that means, but my patient gave me this book whenever I was uh, my second year into practice. He said he was reading it in his book club, uh, okay. Um, but it really talked about this sort of gift of imperfection. So perfectionism is a belief that you can avoid pain, blame, judgment, or shame by looking or acting perfect. It is not technically about self-improvement. It is about earning acceptance and earning approval. And so in this book, it talks about letting go of perfectionism, but you have to realize that there are types, types of perfectionism. So there is adaptive perfectionism, and that's what we do whenever we think, okay, it's healthy, I'm, a, I'm achieving this, and I'm super excited, and I, I did this great thing, but you do not have the self-criticism. 
Whereas maladaptive is where you do something and you do something well, but then you have this extreme self-criticism that kicks in and you develop all of these negative attitudes associated. Um, and then for, and here's a, uh, not really an example. I don't want to give a personal example, maybe. But um, when you develop negative attitudes, when things that you are unable to control go outside of your planning. So one of the most maladaptive things that you can do is, so you have something lined up, you do it the same way every time, and somehow it doesn't go exactly the way you expected it to. And you fall into this overtly cycle of, I'm terrible, I'm a terrible um, physician, I did a terrible job, et cetera. Rather than learning from the experience of, this is the way I could have done it differently. I am, you know, you, you move into a very um, negative space. So letting go of maladaptive perfectionism is actually very important. And the way to do that are through some of these very wishy-washy techniques. So self-kindness, um, eliminating negative self-talk. This is one of the most hard things to do because a lot of people are programmed. They've been doing it for, for years, decades even. Common humanity, understanding that suffering and personal inadequacy is actually something that all of us go through. You are not the only person. And then having a very balanced approach to negative thoughts through mindfulness and meditation, which we've had a little bit of talk about uh, mindfulness meditation. But see, when you are meditating, you bring in those negative thoughts, you recognize them, you do not ignore them, but then you let them go. So when we look at educator methods, so that's two methods that you can use for internal um, improvement of confidence. So we're going to look at two methods for educator um, uh, methods. And these are methods that I think are incredibly difficult. So residents and medical students are most comfortable when they are in their own learning style. And there are some of these very specific learning styles for trainees. There's the competitive, collaborative, avoidant, participant, dependent, and independent kind of learning methods that each trainee has. And a lot of people believe that as an educator, if you can adapt your style to what the, the trainee is and recognize that maybe they are more of a dependent or independent trainee and sort of give them tasks in that way, that you may be able to do a better job with educating. So the most effective learners are really able to adapt that way. And examples of this sort of way that you would adapt to a uh, trainee style is maybe you take a learner who, or you take a trainee who is competitive, and then you put them into a environment where they need to be collaborative. So you're trying to help them build skills of running a small group session, encouraging other members to participate. And that's a way that you can actually malalign the trainee with the um, activities and see if that helps them. So there are two alternating thoughts on here. You either put them in their environment all the time or you make them uncomfortable to where they learn other skills. I think this is incredibly difficult. We don't spend enough time with every single trainee for me to understand if they're competitive or collaborative or avoidant. Um, and so using some alternative teaching methods and recognizing what our style is possibly and adjusting our styles to the content, the setting, the number of learners or the approach is another way to do it. And these are some of the teaching styles. So some of us are in, in these alternate in certain atmospheres, you may be an expert, whereas in other atmospheres, you may be a delegator or you may use formal authority or personal modeling, modeling or even facilitating. But being able to move between these different teaching styles whenever you're working with various residents is a better way of actually using alternative methods. So in times whenever you feel that, or if you are more of a um, formal authority in certain activities, maybe you try to delegate a little bit or you try to be a facilitator to get the resident to do things on their own. And so the last part that I'm going to talk about is goal-directed learning and goal-directed training because this is, um, these methods are, are quite fascinating to me. So there is this technique called the Zwish technique. It's based on stages of operating um, and then there is the pre-post debriefing and then there's this concept of teachable moments. So when you look at the Zwish model of surgical training, there are four stages that you go through. You go through this show and tell, 
Then you become, as the trainee, or as the educator, you do a show and tell, smart help, dumb help, and then no help. And this is sort of what it looks like from the resident perspective and from the attending perspective. So when you are in the show and tell stage, this is sort of taking a resident through their first operation. They've never seen it, they've never done it, they don't know anything about it. So you perform some of the key portions, but maybe you let them do the opening and closing of the, the belly or the opening and closing of the skin. Um, most of the time the resident acts as the first assistant, assistant, but that is an active learning process where they are observing the procedure. Then you move <clears throat> for a trainee into smart help where you're shifting between being the surgeon and the first assistant, but you're explaining the case in some way. And so, and the resident is also shifting and verbalizing that shift and how you're shifting is important. Then you move into what's called dumb help, where you as the attending act as the resident and the resident acts as the faculty member and takes you through the case. And then you get to a no help um, portion. And so when they looked at this technique, what they did is they had residents and attendings take 10 different cases, laparoscopic coli, um, laparoscopic appendectomy, uh, hernia, some of those cases, and they graded or they put them on the scale of where they thought they would be. Do they thought they would be for what every level? So at the PGY1 level, we thought this would be a smart um, help case or whatever it may be. And so then they did a study where they looked at the expected score for each case, and then after the procedure was done, residents kind of assessed how it went. Did they act as the no, or did it go as a no help case? Did it go as a smart help case? Where was it actually? And the perceptions that the faculty and resident have for these ideas that they would operate in this independent level for certain um, PGY, or they operate in a no help um, atmosphere for a PGY-5 actually was inaccurate. So there was this gap between where residents and faculty perceived the trainee should be and where they actually performed in terms of autonomy. And this is something that we'll, again, there, I know that there's a talk later on coming about perceptions and expectations. And that's something where um, maybe changing our perceptions or expectations can help us bridge this autonomy gap. Goal-directed learning is a really interesting concept to me. It's where it's set up by both the trainee, the, the preoperative goals, so you do a preoperative debrief. Those are set by the trainee. Operative focus on achieving those goals within the case, that's done by the trainee and the faculty. During the case, you try to make sure that you go back to some of these key concepts. And then you have this post-operative debriefing at the end where you discuss between the faculty and the trainee. And when they've looked at how this works over time, what they did in this particular case, they rolled this out in phases. In phase one was the pre-intervention when they looked at um, achievement of some of these tasks or, or the communication style and um, how the conversations went through the cases versus after the implementation of the program, they found that within the second phase after they had implemented this standard of preoperative, operative, and um, postoperative debriefing, they found that there was more communication between the faculty and the residents. Um, in terms of conversing with the residents, there was a little bit less in phase two, but answering questions was higher in the second phase. The faculty were more likely to answer questions. They were more likely to um, joke with the resident a little bit. They were less likely to ask closed-ended <coughs> questions and more likely to ask open-ended questions. And my favorite one of all is they were more likely to use profanity in the second phase, which I, I don't know, maybe that means they're more comfortable. So that's another technique. And the final technique is this idea of teachable moments. So most teachable moments arrive from uh, errors, from um, some kind of error within the case. And there are interactions that you can do in terms of how you communicate. Instrumental interactions are where the goal of the interaction within the case is just to tell the resident how to move the case along. Teaching interactions are intended to be a conversation just to benefit the learner through providing some type of education. And then there are these um, discussions that are intended to be both. And then there's banter. And in the, the study that where they looked at teachable moments, they observed 60 cases. And within these cases, there were 1,300 interactions. And they found that within each case, we tend to cover somewhere between 13 and 29 topics. 
that is drinking from the fire hose in terms of education. And each topic could be covered anywhere from one to eight times, and then the, the time per topic. But if you break down how it is, they found that there are instances of verbal teaching that arise opportunistically. And if you take those and focus them either in the form of guiding the resident in terms of how to move the case along or being educational and guiding the resident, those were more helpful than if you used those times as pure educational. And so it is important to consider this because there are such a large number of topics that are covered within each case, having pre-post goals is really important. So in terms of conclusions, this is always my favorite conclusion slide and I, I put it up every <laughs> single time. Um, I think there's a, a part here where some of us are overexcited and some of us are the ones being slapped in the face. But education and teaching confidence stems from so many different aspects. There is the trainee and their ability to have confidence. Some of that confidence needs to come within. Some of it also needs to come from understanding competencies and moving through the competencies. But we as educators also need to understand those competencies, recognize limitations that may be coming more from confidence and then show our trainees how to build both in their time here. So thank you very much. Great talk, Misty. I think that the, uh, the knowledge we have about pedagogy and how people really uh, learn, how adult learners learn, how we communicate with one another is an important thing for us to be thinking about all the time. Questions? Dr. Humphreys. Yes. That was a great talk. You know, I really think that one of the issues is that we've got such a culture of perfection now mm -hmm. where, you know, residents graduate, they see, you know, there are never events we talk about, right? Yeah. Nothing's never. We see we, you shouldn't do this operation if you have this complication, right? you can't do this, you can't do that. And I think you're scared to death that, you know, you make one little slip up, it's going to affect your credentials, you're going to have lawsuits, whatever. And I think part of kind of maturity as you graduate is to, and one of the reasons people do you know, fellowships or come to transition to practice programs, have junior partner partners, is to have kind of that backup saying, hey, it's okay, you know, we're not all perfect. You know, you know I don't always make the right decision. I, this happened to me. You know, and these partners then can kind of allay some of these fears that even though we want perfection, that everybody is human and that you have to then do the best, you know, fall back on your training. You've got good training, you've got good mentors, and that you know you will step forward as time passes, and I think that's super important to have those people you can bounce off. Of. Even though we want things to be perfect, they're not all the time. Absolutely, and when I talk to the residents and they're looking for practices or you know they're interested in going places, that is probably the most important thing that I tell them is your partners, who you are going to work with, the atmosphere that you're going to be going into, because they will make or break you. Without having <coughs> Dr. Pedic or Dr. Dawson, who I can call all the time, I. Have, would have made more mistakes. I called Dr. Pevick in the middle of the night sometimes, and he carries his pager on the weekends when he's not on call, when he knows that me or one of the other more junior people are on call, because I do call him, and I rely on that. Yes, Heath Charvet, so excited. Yeah, that was a good talk, I think, I think from like a resident perspective, one of the big issues, like, when you talk to surgeons that trained four years ago, they described the residency as like the Braille system. They just felt their way through it and figured it out and made mistakes at the expense of a patient, but you learned, and when you got out, you were, you were independent. And I kind of feel like with patient safety, the terms change now where our chief residents are acting like third-year residents 30 years ago, and our interns of 30 years ago are acting like our third-year residents now. And then when you're out in your first two years of practice, you're actually acting like the chief residents of 30 years ago and like talking to some of the people at Kaiser, they've even talked about going through a mentor system where when you get hired in, if someone's going to retire, that person shares the call schedule with you for an entire year where you actually do your own clinic and they're on backup. If you need them, you can call them in and help you. And I don't know if there's like a right answer to the, to the situation, but I feel like as time goes on and we're more focused on patient safety, it's going to come at the loss of resident learning. Um, you know, as you get older in your training, there are certain services that will allow you to autonomously operate where the attending is present in the room but not actually scrubbed in, which is, I think, an invaluable experience where the fives and six seven, PGY five, six sevens are walking PGY three, four, five, some cases. Um, 
but it's just, I think maybe that's just the way medicine's going to, in order to and that may be an idea of that sort of perceived expectation where you think you might be in, in sort of where we are. So the goal is maybe to um, build comfort with the faculty by doing some of these techniques. You know, try to use some of this. The goal for this case is from, I want, at the end of this case, I want to be able to know the exact steps, 10 steps to do in this case. Um, I do this sometimes with Cole whenever we did the first ribs. We go through the 10 steps of how to do it. And by the end of it, I know that he can walk me through the case verbally he can't necessarily do it, but then when it comes time to let him do it, I'm pretty more, I'm more comfortable with it. Uh, doctor, um, well, doctor, I'll let you go first. Perfect. Sorry. Yeah, I know, I'm not sorry, then Jacob reads the hand and I got confused. No, I want to call him what he said because <clears throat> I think it's, this current situation is actually really, really good. And I have experienced the opposite experience. I went to medical school in Peru where the residents were left to their own devices and patients were operated by mid level residents without any supervision and the results were dismal. I mean, you know, when I was a medical student, we would be putting the patients into the operating room and there would be a third year resident who was like bumping for the book trying to figure out how to do things because the attendants were unavailable. 